Hello, everyone. This is number 13 in my series on Jesus archaeology, looking at texts and material or archaeological evidence and see what kind of light one might shed on the other and how we might get a better sense of what we call the historical figure of Jesus. And we've been doing the last days of Jesus, the last few episodes, and now we've come down to the arrest and trials. And notice I said plural, People in their heads kind of have the idea that the Jewish priests grabbed Jesus and condemned him, took him to Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect or governor, and then he was crucified. And in terms of who's responsible and all that happened that night, it's very confusing to people. We have accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They don't all agree. So I want to try to sort some of that out for us today. And I'm going to go ahead. I prepared some slides here. Okay, final days of Jesus. This has been our track for the last few episodes. We started with Messianic Temple takeover. That's what's narrated as Jesus arrives in Jerusalem and goes up into the temple and essentially shuts it down or part of it down for most of a day and confronts the authorities directly. Then you get, for several days, confrontations in Herod's temple. We did a virtual tour of the temple. I gave you a commentary. Then the final evening meal, uh, sometimes called the Last Supper. And where that was, I suggested it was on Mount Zion, maybe even in the very spot that is now revered as the headquarters of the Jesus movement, the so-called upper room or the cynical. That's a medieval structure, but it's on foundations of a first century structure. And then the arrest in Gethsemane, that's a secret garden area on the Mount of Olives, not the one today that tourists are taken to. We don't know exactly where it is, but it's actually where Jesus would go as a kind of a safe place when he was in Jerusalem because he was being watched and tracked and the intent was to arrest him from the day he arrived back here. So now today we've come to the trials, plural, and we've got three characters involved. Usually Annas is left out and forgotten, and he's going to become a real key to understanding what happened. He's the father-in-law of the high priest Caiaphas. But it's not just that Caiaphas happened to marry his daughter. He was high priest himself, and he has five sons that serve as high priest, plus Caiaphas, his son-in-law. So he's in control, as we'll see. And then the Roman prefect or governor, Pontius Pilate. And then crucifixion and burial and sightings of Jesus we will do next time, number 14. And then I'm going to have a final episode on method, often called methodology, but I call it method. There's what is the method by which you go about sorting out texts and archaeology, and, and how did I come to some of the conclusions that I've reached, and is it just an arbitrary cherry-picking, flip a coin, whatever I happen to like, I say that's it, or is there a method to the so-called madness, as we say? So let's get started on the trials. The way the trials are described is quite interesting. I'm going to start with Mark, which is our earliest text, the Gospel of Mark, and he doesn't even name the high priest. Isn't that interesting? No details given. After Gethsemane, he's arrested. They led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and elders and scribes were assembled. That's during the middle of the night. He was arrested after midnight. It's probably two or three in the morning when he's snatched. And then down here in chapter 15, as you keep reading about this trial, as soon as it was morning, the chief priests and elders and scribes and the whole council, that's the Sanhedrin, held a consultation, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. So this is an official Jewish action of jurisprudence, but they didn't have the right to condemn somebody to death, which is what they're looking for. So... What happens is Peter is following at a distance, even though he fled with all the others. And as we're going to see, there's another disciple with him. We'll get to that in a minute. And he's in the courtyard of the high priest. 
but it's not clear who this is. Is this Annas? Is this Caiaphas? And also, if the whole council is trying to condemn him, and yet they're not even assembled, you can see that this is what you would call a preliminary hearing or a setup. It's not a legal procedure. It's an illegal procedure in the middle of the night. And there is abuse. They're spitting upon him, sarcastically covering his face, hitting him and saying, hey, if you're the son of God, who just hit you? What's my name? And so forth. And other blows that the guards have. These are basically Jewish authorities that guard the temple. But in the Gospel of John, the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews seized Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now, we know all of this from our historian Josephus, who's a first century historian that records all the priests and everything about them. But Mark doesn't really seem to know the details, which doesn't surprise me. Whereas the Gospel of John is relying upon a testimony or a source of someone who is more involved, apparently. So they go to Annas, and Annas is not even mentioned here, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, high priest that year. Peter in the courtyard, warming himself, denies Jesus three times, and Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So this helps you straighten out the jumble here of confusion as when they met and where they met and who they met, and we can pretty much lay that out based upon comparing this with John. And also in the Gospel of Luke, there's more material that does seem to shed light on this scenario. So let's talk about what's going on here. First of all, I want to mention what I call the priestly mafia under Annas, because this goes through the first century. It goes through the time of Jesus all the way up to the death of James and beyond. And please notice these names. You've got the father Annas, who is high priest from the year 6 to 15 CE. Then his son Eleazar gets in in 16, and he goes just for two years. And then the son-in-law, there he is, Joseph Caiaphas, 18 to 36. So he has a long rule. But even though Caiaphas is high priest for a considerable amount of time and does preside over the death sentence of Jesus, the declaration to take him to Pontius Pilate, notice that Annas is really in the background, really running things. And so Caiaphas, I think, is basically a figurehead, as are these other sons. You get Jonathan, son of Annas, 36, Theophilus, son of Annas, 37, now, Simon uh, Cantheros uh, is not part of the Annas family, but he's in with them and just as corrupt. And then Matthias, son of Annas. And then finally, an Annas, named after his father, son of Annas, in the year 62, who murders James, the brother of Jesus. So this is some background that people often are not familiar with when they're reading the Gospels. Jesus is up against a very rigid and corrupt Jewish establishment, and who are very corrupt in their running of the temple for their own power and their own profit. They're very worried about Jesus because he has favor with the people. And remember, Jesus confronted them in the temple when he's asked, what authority do you have to do what you're doing? And he says, well, what about John the Baptist? Uh, what authority did he have? Uh, meaning uh, God called him, right? And they say, well, we, we can't answer that. We can't say. Because they had rejected John, just like they rejected Jesus. So you basically got Herod Antipas in the Galilee, who kills John the Baptist and is trying to kill Jesus. Then you've got the mafia priesthood after him as well. And the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. So it's pretty complex when you read the Gospels as to how did Jesus come to be crucified that morning, the day before the Passover festival. So let's talk about this. I covered a bit of this in a previous episode when I was talking about what the Gospel of John adds to the record. But here's the Jewish quarter. Here's a map, a Nat Geo map of Jerusalem today. 
this Jewish quarter right here, this would be the way it is today, Muslim quarter, Christian quarter, and Armenian quarter. Armenian are also Christians. So all of this is Christian. This is Muslim. There's the Temple Mount, or the Haram, as the Muslims call it, the Noble Sanctuary. And here's the Jewish quarter. So you, if you've seen that video, you can go back on my YouTube channel, and I have a commentary version and a music version where you can kind of fly around the temple area and go into the tunnels and see the gates and so forth. But the first place that they take him, we believe, is right near the temple. So he's arrested in Gethsemane and is taken back into the city to Annas's house, the house of the high priest. And that is basically what's being excavated here. Now, how could the Jewish quarter be excavated this extensively? The reason is that when the Jordanians controlled the old city from 1948 to 1967, they destroyed much of the Jewish quarter, including some very priceless synagogues that go back for centuries. And so when the Israelis retook the city in 1967, and all Jews had been expelled during that period from 48 to 67, they took advantage of the destruction, archaeologically speaking, look at that, mosaic floors and so forth, and we're going to go down and look at those. And then they rebuilt the Jewish quarter over these archaeological remains of first century Jewish Jerusalem. And so this area of Jerusalem is now preserved underground as it was in the first century. Whenever I take groups to Israel, my Tracking Jesus tour, this is one of the main things we do. We don't just walk around the streets of Jerusalem, you know, 20 feet above the ancient level. We go down below and survey what it was like in the first century, and it's really extraordinary. Here's some of the ruins. You can see the steps coming down from the ground level, which would be way up above, probably about 20 feet above. And now you're down to the first century, and you're inside the priestly mansion. You can see his bathtub here, mikvah, all kinds of storage areas down below, and a nice mosaic floor. Now, this was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, so there's a lot of damage but the basic foundations of the house are quite intact. Here's a model of the house and what it looks like. And this is the judgment hall right here where Jesus would have been tried or uh, questioned by the priests. This is the courtyard where Peter's hanging out and ends up denying Jesus three times. So they would enter this door here into the courtyard and uh, Jesus is taken on inside for the proceedings. So we know where this is, and this model is actually set in the place where it happened. It's actually in the courtyard. Pretty amazing to walk through these doors, I'm telling you, and the floor is authentic and original from the first century. Here's a little composite view. This is the judgment hall. This is what it looks like. They call it a reception hall. The Jesus would have been brought in through the courtyard this is the courtyard you saw, and here's an artist's conception of what it might have looked like. You can see some of the paneling in the remains, and it can kind of be reconstructed virtually from that, so you get an idea. So this is where Jesus first appeared. Here's a painting by my artist, Balage that I use, and he's picturing Jesus, the figure here, kneeling down in front of the high priest, but this is early in the morning. It's not the official meeting of the Sanhedrin or the Jewish court of the 70 elders, okay? So it's really an illegal late night proceeding. It's what people later called in our day a kangaroo court, uh, and that has some interesting origins if you want to look it up. But basically, a decision is made, uh, let's get him. As soon as daybreak comes, let's condemn Jesus. So when you go to Jerusalem and see this archaeology, it makes the story come alive because you're in the actual room where it happened. It is the space, and it's the first century space, not like the Last Supper that is a crusader structure above the space. This is on the ground. You can actually walk around inside it. Now, as far as a map again, just to be clear on where we are in the first century, 
Uh, here's guess that's traditional Gethsemane. So Jesus is arrested somewhere up on the Mount of Olives, taken in probably through the gate here, but not into the temple, but around. Remember Robinson's Arch, and the priestly mansion is right in this area here. So that would be underground today. Then he's going to be taken to Caiaphas's house, and. I've been involved in an excavation on Mount Zion right here. Here's the spot. And here it is on a Google map where you can see it. So this is how the Temple Mount looks today from the air. And you can still see the outline of the city. And this is where we're actually excavating outside the Turkish wall, which was still part of Jerusalem in the first century. It's actually right in the center where we're excavating. And we have come across a another priestly mansion. Now, I'm not claiming it's the House of Caiaphas. There are three candidates for the House of Caiaphas, okay? The Catholics have one right here, just below where ours is. The Roman Catholics have a place right here. It's called uh, St. Peter Gallicano. It has to do with the cock crowing, and it's right here, just south of our excavation. The Armenians have their own place up here, just inside uh, the Mount Zion compound area. But somewhere here was the house of Caiaphas. We have descriptions of it as pilgrims began to retrace the last days of Jesus and some of the diaries we have and so forth. And one of the things they talk about is going down here to the Pool of Siloam and then walking up to Mount Zion and passing the house of Caiaphas. They don't know about this because this was destroyed by the Romans in this 70 CE, and it would just be rubble, and then Hadrian rebuilt Jerusalem. And only in 1967 did this get excavated, and we find this amazing house of Annas the high priest. So uh, Jesus would have been brought here, and then somewhere in this area, is the house of Caiaphas. And then if you keep going up, that would be the upper room. So it's kind of a round trip. Jesus eats the Last Supper. He walks down out the Kidron Valley, up the uh, Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then is arrested and taken back, tried before Annas, or at least pronounced as guilty. So the beginning of his sufferings that early morning hour, and then taken to Pontius Pilate, which is going to be right here, the Praetorium. It's going to be on the west side of the city, and we'll see that as we go on. So this gives you a nice overview. There's the Temple Mount. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Thank you, Shimon Gibson, for taking this. Here's the Mount of Olives. Here's the Temple Mount. You can see those are those Hulda gates we talked about. You can see all of that. Modern city. Over here is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And right in front of the Turkish wall, but remember, it's center city in the time of Jesus, is our house. Let's just call it a priestly mansion. I'll put a link in the description where you can go read about the archaeology of this site, but it's really fabulous. And it just so happens that this is a first century dwelling. These are the lower levels of a first century house. And there might be other houses as you go up Mount Zion. The room of the Last Supper is over to the left here. So here's a view as we were beginning to excavate and uncover. We started this in 2006, and we stopped for COVID in 2020. And we will be resuming things this summer, not with a full-scale dig, but catching up after COVID. And what we've been finding is amazing. And there's the Mount of Olives. Look at that. And so we have a view of the Mount of Olives constantly when we're excavating here. And you got a picture in the time of Jesus, this wall is not here. The Roman Catholic site is just across the road and down the hill, and the Armenian site is just up the hill, and this is our site. And again, I'm not saying this is the house of Caiaphas, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying it shows us what a private Roman priestly mansion would be like, and we do have evidence that this is a priestly mansion, just not any kind of mansion by some of the things that we've excavated. And that'll be covered in the article. Here's a nice aerial view you can see. Again, remove the Turkish wall mentally, and you're in the center of the city during the time of Jesus. 
as you go down into it, you find a mikvah, private bath, very luxurious. It's even got a ceiling. This is a room from the first century, the time of Jesus, and I think it's the only one ever found with the ceiling intact. In other words, that is the ceiling of the bathtub area. It would have probably had mosaics and all kinds of finery, but remember it was destroyed by the Romans. This is the kitchen with three different bread ovens, what's left of them, and your own private mikvah or ritual pool of immersion that's right next to the bathtub. And this bathtub is actually grander and larger than the one in Annas's house. So let's just call it a priestly mansion. Here's what it would have looked like in the time of Jesus, looking out over the upper levels. There's the temple, there's the Mount of Olives, and you can imagine the luxury of the priests living in this location, the furniture and all of this drawing is very authentic in terms of what it would have been like based on excavations at Pompeii, excavations in Jerusalem, the kind of furniture, the kind of furnishings that would be used at that time. So I love this picture. You picture the priestly families who lived here looking out over the veranda and they could see the temple activities. Now, here's an amazing discovery, accidental, made by a bulldozer in November of 1990 during construction south of the old city of Jerusalem down in the Hinnom Valley was found a tomb that appears to be the family tomb of Caiaphas, the son-in-law and the high priest. Isn't that amazing? And here is his ossuary, beautifully decorated, a bone box, and yes, the skeletal remains of Joseph Caiaphas were inside. I will in the future talk more about this, but today we're just doing a survey. On the side here, it, it's on display in the Israel Museum, the actual thing. You can see an inscription. It's very informal. This is where you just scratch on the ossuary on the side who this is. And here's a close up. Joseph Bar Kaffa, Joseph Bar Kaffa, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. So in the New Testament, it just says Caiaphas, it doesn't say Joe Caiaphas or Joseph Caiaphas, Joseph. But in Josephus, we're told that the son in law of Annas, who ruled from 18 to 36 during the time of Jesus, had Jesus crucified, was in fact Joseph Caiaphas. It's a very amazing find. Here is our map again. We're going to now go from wherever the Caiaphas house was, either down here, maybe in the area where we're digging, maybe a little up on the hill. You can see from that picture, all the priestly crowd wants to live up here because they have this beautiful view of the temple and the Mount of Olives. So here's a model of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. We've looked at this before when we were surveying the temple and how it looked. There's the Fortress Antonio. There's Herod's temple that he built and the courtyards. But to the west, outside the western city wall, you would have the judgment seat of Pilate. Now, this model has not added it yet. It's actually right here. And we're going to see a reconstruction of it. But inside... This western wall was Herod's palace. Herod the Great built this palace. You can see it has two huge residential areas with courtyards and fountains and all kinds of things in between. So Pontius Pilate, as the governor of Judea, has traveled from Caesarea on the Mediterranean, Caesarea Maritima, it's called, named for Augustus Caesar. Herod built that beautiful city for the emperor himself. And Pontius Pilate, during the festival of Passover, would come to Jerusalem just to have a military presence there, because there could be potential trouble, of course. And even though this model has not been updated even today, we can now know that there was a gate right here. Now, here's what it looks like today. When it was excavated in the 70s, the soil was all the way up here and just sloped down. When I first went to Jerusalem in the 1960s, this was just a hill of dirt going down. But once it was excavated, and my colleague Shimon Gibson was part of that, he was just a young guy, 
you can see that these are steps going into a Turkish wall, into nowhere. But all of this is Herodian. This is bedrock. Bedrock does not change. So this was a gate into Herod's palace on the south side. And right here, you have the bedrock foundations of steps going into the gate. The gate's not there anymore, of course, because Jerusalem was destroyed. But this is all still intact. This is first century. The steps are first century. It's amazing. And up here is where Pontius Pilate would set up his court or his judgment seat. So we call this Pilate's judgment seat. And if you read the account in Mark, Luke, John, really those three in particular, you'll see a vivid description of the crowds outside here not going into the judgment area because they're going to eat the Passover that night. And then Pontius Pilate going in, coming out, going in, coming out three different times as he's questioning Jesus, finally sends him even to Herod Antipas, who's in town, and then he's sent back. And by that time, he's been scourged and whipped and beaten and really weakened. And this is the early morning hours when the council was able to wake Pontius Pilate up and say, we've got this prisoner, we want him crucified. Here's a reconstruction of what it might have looked like with a Jesus figure here and the stairways and so forth. So uh, you go with me to Jerusalem, we will go right here we will walk up the steps, we'll get a view, and up at the very top, I'll show you, you can stand on what's called the Gabbatha, the pavement mentioned in the Gospel of John right here. And some of the paving stones have been dug out and disappeared over the centuries, but look at this. These are intact, these are intact, these are intact. This is where Pontius Pilate would have his court set up, and there's steps going down, and then there's the gate. So Jesus would have been brought up here. And that's the famous place where Pilate would have said, behold the man, and what do you want me to do with him, and the deliberations back and forth. And I want to share another visual with you, because I have something much more extensive on my blog. This is jamestabor.com, as you can see. And if you go there and search for Eke Homo, behold a man in Latin, standing again with Jesus, Eke Homo revisited, I have an article in which I discuss more fully this judgment seat of Pilate and everything about it. So I want to refer you to that as well. Notice it's got links and all kinds of other material here. So there you go. There's the Oxford map, and it actually has the mark of where the palace was, and this would be Pilate's judgment seat. So that should give you a good idea of what we're talking about. And I hope you have uh, benefited from this presentation. Next time, uh, for number 14, we're going to look at crucifixion, death, and burial of Jesus. Where was it? What was involved in crucifixion? Everything we know about it. And there is some new archaeological evidence about crucifixion that isn't very widely known yet. And it does change everything in terms of understanding what it might have been like in the time of Jesus. And then we're going to talk about where that was, where was Jesus crucified, as well as where was he buried and why was there an empty tomb on Sunday morning when the women came and visited the tomb and so forth. And we'll talk about sightings of Jesus. So that's next time. And for the final episode, number 15, I want to talk about method. What is my method in presenting this series with 14 episodes and all the archaeology and all the texts kind of jumbled together in a hopper? And how did I decide, methodologically speaking, to come up with what I came up with? So take care, everyone. I'll see you next time.